on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Layman presented by Riverwind Casino. We revisit some of the things that Coach Venables told us and talk about the Sooners at the NFL Combine. Then we talk some rule changes that are coming to college football, possible 14-team college football playoff, and we finish with our winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Monday, March 4th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful, award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, the Raps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts and to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of march all you got to do is visit riverwind.com riverwind casino simply the best now we're recording this sunday night please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment also if your business wants to advertise on the podcast please email us at the oklahoma breakdown at gmail.com ted layman how we doing sir i'm doing fantastic man Beautiful weekend, had a lot of good sports going on. So, yeah, life is good. There is, there's a lot to cover, uh, especially OU-wise. Got a lot going on right now, but let's start by revisiting some of the more interesting things that Brent Venables told us uh, on the last episode of the podcast. And if you haven't listened to that, what are you doing? Go back and listen (laughs) to that. Coach Venables went through dang near the entire roster, but Ted, unfortunately, I think we got to start with some just awful news that Jacob Lacey's having to hang up the cleats. Uh, you saw him posted on social media, uh, going to have to medically retire because of blood clots. It, it's such a bummer for him as a player, clearly, but man, that is a, that's a significant loss for this football team. He was going to play a ton of snaps for them in the interior of that defensive line. And you're and losing a veteran guy like that as you head in the SEC, man, that that one hurts. Yeah, it does. You know, I, I think one of the great things about our defense is all, we have a lot of depth. We got safeties coming out of our ears. We've got, you know, there's going to be a good competition at corner. Plenty of backers that you feel comfortable out there on the field. Edge guys, like, totally different position we've been in the last couple of years. But we're thin at the interior defensive line. And that's, like, the one spot really on the whole football team that you're kind of hanging on, hoping that uh, the guys that are coming back, you know, play and, uh, you know, get better and develop. But you need some young guys, too. So the fact that you're losing one of your veteran guys that's going to be a hit, and you heard Coach Vittable say that um, they could be going into the transfer portal, the post spring window. Uh, so, man, you hate that. Yeah, you know, I thought originally, like, I think this was an issue way back after last spring, right throughout the summer, and thought maybe it was going to happen then. But he was able to play last year and got some good snaps for us. You know, he's not one of those guys that's he's not real big. Uh, he doesn't just blow you away with the measurables, but he plays with good low pad level and good technique and was a productive player for him. This is, I, I promise this is a nice thing. He, he's better than he looks. Yeah. And when you go out there on the field and you see him before the game, you just look at him. You go, ah, I, I mean, how many plays is that guy going to make going to make? And he made a lot of important plays. He was also one of the guys that, he was not afraid of doing the dirty work, right? Taking up double teams so Stutzman and and Canick and Kip Lewis, those guys could go make plays. He was an unselfish guy in the interior of that defensive line, and it's a guy that they're going to miss. I, I'm with you, man. I think that as excited as they are about the young guys, right, you think about 
Marcus Strong and e- even a guy like Grayson Halton, uh, Ashton Sanders, of course, David Stone and Jaden Jackson that are there as early enrollees. Like You can be really, really excited about all those young players, but also acknowledge that you probably want to get a guy that's been in a college football weight program and played some big time snaps. You, you got to go find a guy like that in the portal, right? In the, in the spring portal window. If they're there, I mean, that's, that's the thing is you, you, you're kind of bound by what's there and, and what you can convince to come to your school. But yes, I mean, the answer is absolutely. You need, you need some veteran experience and i I'm, I guess you never know, but I'm doubtful they're going to find a superstar defensive tackle in the portal post spring. But you can find capable guys, guys that have played, maybe guys that are at places that have a new staff and they're not liking the defense or they're not liking, you know, you know, their position coach. However, that goes. Um, but you can add guys. We added Dejon Terry there in the, in the post spring window last year, so. You can do it, and yeah, they got to get experience in there. And you know, here's the thing: is I we've got some good young talent that's that's coming, but it's still really small. All right, we're still those guys are all still, at least for the time being, on the small size. All right, we we need some size on the interior. Uh, I think, especially when you're talking about David Stone and Jaden Jackson, you see the frame. Smalls, maybe not the big, they're just light. They're light. light. Yeah. Yeah. They're just, they're light at this point in their career. And you want them to add the proper way, the right way. But when you look at this, you look at this Jacob Lacey situation, maybe that fast tracks things for those two guys. Now I'm expecting those two guys to play, especially Jaden Jackson, just some of the things that, You know, the staff has been saying about him throughout winter workouts. I think he's going to be a guy that's going to contribute right away. And I expect the same for David Stone, but I I don't want to say it puts pressure on those two guys in particular. I just feel like this entire group of young defensive tackles. Now we need a couple of dudes to step up and separate themselves. Yeah, without a doubt. Absolutely. And, you know, there's really there could be excuses previously. Like if the back end, the the second level guys, your linebackers aren't very good and they're not attacking downhill and they're not getting you lined up and communication. Is not there? Like it can make life on a defensive tackle very difficult, but as good and as experienced as we are everywhere else, it's the perfect environment for a young guy to come in and be able to play really well, really quickly if that makes sense. Absolutely. Now we'll see how that position group as a whole progresses throughout spring practice. I know you and I will have, we'll have a close eye on that group because I've never, I've never seen a defense that played really, really good defense that didn't have a good defensive line. Yeah. So that may be the biggest question mark going into spring ball for not only for the defense, but for the entire football team. Now, one other interesting thing that BV told us, and I hated hearing it, man. Desan McCullough has basically just had to miss winter workouts because of that knee procedure. And Ted, he's one of those guys that he needed to make strength gains. He needed to make strength gains. He's just a long limbed guy. Like he needed to make strength gains. He needed to make some gains when it comes to his explosiveness, especially in his lower body. And and I was really hopeful that another full off season at OU, he'd be able to add some power, some explosiveness. Man, it's just really unfortunate that he wasn't able to have a, a full winter healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's going to stunt his growth a little bit. Um, you know, it did sound like he's going to be ready to go in spring, though. So, like, I don't know if that means be doing individual and, and maybe some seven-on-seven seven, or if he's going to be, 
you know, full go. I don't know, but uh, I agree with you there. What, so what's it like if you've got a lower body injury, you're not up for winter conditioning, but I, I'm, how do you, how do they manage like the upper body stuff? I don't know. We were never hurt, dude. Yeah. No, I, I, I figure that they still, uh, he'll still be getting like the upper body stuff in. Oh, for sure. I, yeah. I would be really, really surprised if he hasn't added some size like in his yeah. shoulders. But then again, I just, how are they going to use him? I keep coming back to that because there were moments last year where he had some flashes at the cheetah spot where you're like, okay, he's making plays out in space. And then you saw at other times, like you saw his limitations in coverage and it, it was a glaring issue at points in time. But I just, I just still don't know how they're going to use him. And I think the way yeah. that they were going to use him would probably be really influence the type of weight they wanted him to add, like and all of that type of stuff throughout the winter. But I, I just, I don't know where he fits, especially with how good Dolby looked at when he was at the cheetah spot and playing like a true nickel. So I, I don't know. I I'm just, I, I think the way that they're going to use him moving forward, that's, that's one of the more interesting things when you look at the entire roster to me is where does the San McCullough fit? Yeah. No, I mean, it's a good point. Um, yeah. I don't know at the moment enough about all of the sec offenses, you know, he, because last year they, he was like a Sam and Dolby was like a nickel for the cheetah spot. And I, I imagine like, that's the first thing I think of is if, they're facing big personnel. He'll be out there playing Cheetah or Sam Backer. Um, you know, 11 personnel, spread people, whatever. He'll probably be uh, coming off the field and let Kendall Dolby go out there. But, you know, Justin Harrington, I know we haven't heard from him either, but I, if he gets his medical, as I'm assuming he will, I mean, that throws another guy in the mix. Like, you got Kendall Dolby, who's like the corner version of Cheetah. You got McCullough, who's like the Sam Backer version of Cheetah. And then you've got Harrington, which is like the hybrid of both of those guys, which really is kind of what the position's intended to be. How crazy is it that BV told us that Justin Harrington still hasn't heard from the NCA? I know. I, How? I figured that that would have been. Are they just too busy losing every court case that they can't get back to? Him? Like, what? How is that possible? You would think that it'd be pretty quick to get through the the medical stuff, like right after the season, so guys aren't spending an entire semester in limbo, purgatory, whatever. I, I just don't even know how that's possible. It, it seems like a pretty easy situation to determine. So I, it, it sounded like Venables is very hopeful and they think he's going to get it, but that guy's a dynamic player. If he is back and healthy and, and back from that knee injury, I, I don't know if he's going to be a starter, but I know he's going to play a lot of snaps yeah. because, he's, because he's one of the best athletes on the team. Now, has he had his injury issues? There's no doubt about it. But when you talk about size, length, speed, explosiveness, He's one of the best we got. So we need to know if that guy can play yeah. in 2024 or not. This is ridiculous. And, you know, if, if if he can, at a minimum, he adds great depth at a bunch of different positions and uh, be a hell of a special teams player for you. Gentry Williams, going to miss the spring. We knew that shoulder throughout the season was bad. And that thing was hanging on by a thread. Thought he, he probably could have had surgery on it during the season, but they put it off because he, he was playing at a really high level and because OU was still in the hunt for a Big 12 championship. So it, it's clearly not ideal that he is missing spring ball. You, you want all of your guys that you think are going to be starters working together, especially with Zach Alley coming into the fold and maybe some new intricacies that are going to get installed in the defense. But... Ted, I don't know about you, Gentry Williams, 
I, I feel like I've seen enough from an instincts perspective to where if that guy's healthy, I feel really good about what he's going to do on the football field. So I, yeah. I don't love that he's missing spring, but he's one of those guys where I just look at what we saw from him during the season points of time. He looked like the best player on the field for us. So I am, I'm interested to see what he ends up looking like physically, you know, once he goes through an entire summer and, and they get to camp, but corner it's, I, I'm not concerned. Especially with a guy like him, like he was one of the better tacklers out there at corner. Oh, yeah. He he made a bunch of plays in the running game, right at the line of scrimmage. So uh, he's one of those guys that you know you're not too upset that's not going to be out there banging during spring ball. It's just we'll see you in training camp, big fella. I just just get him to the season healthy, keep that shoulder healthy because he had man, he had some moments throughout the year. Anything else? from what BV talked about on here that really stood out to you that we haven't hit? Um, no, I, well, I mean, there, there was plenty of stuff. I just, and I know I mentioned it earlier. I like the depth, uh, like defensively and, you know, he's pretty clear. He wasn't happy with the corner play last year. And, you know, there's reasons for that. It's not necessarily the personnel, you know, they were, they had a rotating group of guys the entire season because of injury, but that position sounds really promising. In my opinion, um, you got a bunch of capable guys. There's some good size. That's going to be there. You've added some portal guys. So that's going to be a super competitive position here throughout spring. And when he was talking about that corner spot, he mentioned trying Woody Washington at multiple positions. Mm -hmm. So that could be something to keep an eye on is could even though Woody was kind of the consistent guy back there at corner last season, do they think maybe in order to get their best secondary on the field, maybe they move him spots. I, I don't know, Yeah, but yeah, it'll I, be, I think, yeah. it'll be interesting that he said it. So definitely something I'm going to have my eye on. Yeah. And you know, there's, there's a bunch of different ways that you can you can format it and to get your best, you know, three, four cover guys out there, depending on what, what defense they're in. And, you know, kind of, I guess to me, that kind of hints that maybe you see him trying out that cheetah spot a little bit perhaps and sliding in a little closer to the football, but who knows? When you think about Woody's future, like football future, he's probably more of a nickel at the next level anyways. Yeah. So yeah. maybe he recognizes that and goes, yeah, get me on the field. I want to play that. Like, put, put me in the slot. Let's go. Yep. I agree. Combine. Sooners had three guys at the NFL combine. Let's start with Tyler Guyton. Well, he's huge. We knew that <laughs> six, seven, nearly six, eight. I, I thought weighing in at 322 pounds. I thought that's a good weight for him around that yeah. 320, 325. He looked lean, man. He looked good. The 40 time was, it was fine. It was a little slower than I thought it was going to be, but the 34 and a half inch vert makes up for it. Yeah. That is an impressive number for a guy that size. Whoa. Yep. That's, that's what you want to look for right there. I mean, yeah, the 40 is a good show of overall athleticism, but. Like, it's the least thing that's going to carry over to the position that he's playing. Um, explosiveness, uh, like in the vertical, that's a little bit better. And, yeah, that's that's moving a lot of mass a long distance straight up in the air. That's pretty impressive. And I actually thought he looked his best during the drills. He He looked athletic running the 40, but when they were doing the wave drill and you could just see how light, his feet are how fluidly he moves how easy he makes moving at that size look I, I think that's when he stands out amongst the offensive tackle group that is absolutely stacked with guys but he j he looks so fluid and athletic in those drills and, and, it, and they acknowledged it on the broadcast Daniel Jeremiah mentioned it but that's when that's when he looks like he is at his best is when he's actually just 
not thinking so much about running as fast as he can in a straight line, but just being an athlete and, and kind of reacting. I, I thought he looked really, really good in that stuff. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's really always been his strength. And that's what you've always talked about with him is that, that athleticism and the footwork. And, you know, there's some things that he could do at the tackle spot that you just don't see. And that comes from, you know, an athletic background, playing different positions before he finally settled it at tackle. And I guess that's probably a pretty common thing. Guys that transition late to the tackle spot from tight end or, or from another spot. So yeah, it's, it shows for sure. And, you know, I think, I don't think the 40 is going to affect the upside and what people see in him at all. I'm, I'm with you now. If he would have ripped off like a four, eight, five, then he would have been a, the talk of the combine probably. Right. Now that yeah. didn't happen, but I don't think that five, one, nine, I, I don't think that's a number that's going to be a red flag for anyone. That's, that's plenty fast, but yeah, I, I thought overall helped himself. Don't think he hurt himself. You combine it with what he did, not only throughout the season, but what he did at the senior bowl and Guyton is, you know, all, all the indicators reporting to him getting picked in the first round. Yep. Now we'll see. Latest. I saw mock had him like going maybe to the Texans, I believe 23 or 24 pick wouldn't be a bad spot. Go block for CJ Stroud for a decade. Yep. That wouldn't be, wouldn't be a bad gig, man. All right. Andrew Rame. So. Weighs in 6'4", 314, uh, only 32 and a half inch arms. And he didn't test well. He didn't test particularly well. Now, the good news is, ultimately, it's about what you put on tape. And I think Rames got better tape than his testing indicates. But yeah, the numbers weren't good. 24 and a half inch vert, 7 foot 11 broad. That's That's a number that, a lot of teams are going to look at and not like, and then he had a, had a five, four, two 40, which I, I don't know. It just, he, he never, you know, that, that is not a good time. I, but I never thought that he played slow. Yeah. So it was kind of a head scratcher for me. I, I knew that he wasn't going to test particularly well, but I was surprised by a couple of those numbers but in the back of my, my mind, as I was watching, I was like, well, he's a better football player than those numbers. So luckily teams usually care more about the football piece than what you're doing in yeah. shorts and a t-shirt at the combine. Yeah. Those, those are almost numbers that look like maybe something was bothering him a little bit. Um, but that's a good point. It could be, it. you never know. And so three fourteen for weight is, I feel like he was, quite a bit lighter than that am i wrong am i just i think he was always in that okay 310 to 315 uh, i was depending wondering if maybe on... he just at, it was was focused on putting some some weight on or something that hurt his testing numbers but i don't know yeah not probably not the performance he was looking for but hey this is the best news and maybe he ends up redoing it at ou's pro day on march 12th yeah. I, I don't know but it also could be one of those situations where it's like, Hey, I'm not very good at this part of it. I've got it out of the way. Now let's, let's talk some football. Get me, yep. get me on the, uh, get me on the whiteboard. Let's talk about some protections. And I never want to run a 40 ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Probably won't have to. That's the good thing. Yeah. Walter Rouse didn't do any of the testing stuff. I, I couldn't find anything as to why he didn't, but. He looked good in the drills. He looked he looked as in shape as I've seen him. Uh, was almost 6'6", measured in at 6'5 and 3 fourths, 313 pounds, got 35 and an eighth inch arm, which is a really good measurement for him. Didn't run the 40. I couldn't find anything else about it. All I could find was him going through some of the pass protection drills. Looked good doing that, punching the bag, but... Hey. What you see is what you get, right? He's like the perfect size and length for tackle. He's got a ton of a uh, ton of experience. Not gonna blow your doors off with with anything, but he's gonna be a solid, do your job type of guy. And uh, there's a place for that in the NFL. So 
I, I don't think he's really got anything to worry about. I don't know that he's going to be, uh, you know, going super high in the draft, but he's going to get an opportunity to make a, a team somewhere for sure. Yeah. And just going back and thinking about what I saw from him at Stanford and then what we saw from him this year at OU, I, I think he got better. Mm-hmm. I think he became a better football player, which is – why he came to play for Beanbow and to play at Oklahoma. But the one thing I did keep seeing is everyone loves talking to the guy. I mean, he, he had some great interview answers. His presence on the podium was really, really good. And that that's not the most important thing, but it doesn't not matter. Right. Yeah. I mean, that stuff, that stuff, it can, it can get you noticed. And I think that everyone acknowledges how impressive of a guy he is along with being a really good football player. It's a cattle market. We know that if you leave an impression on somebody, like there's a lot of guys that are, let's say it about the same. And if you leave an impression on a couple of people, because uh, you're smart, you got a quick wit, you're easy to talk to. Uh, you're funny. Uh, if you make an impression on people that way, they remember you. You get some positive marks. They circle back to that name and in their meetings and say, hey, I like this guy. It's There's nothing bad about that. It is a really actually a good skill to have. No doubt. All right, let's get to call your shot. We asked you guys the most important thing that happened for OU football this weekend. This one comes from Nick Galona. Galona. G-E-L-O-N-A. Hopefully I got that right, Nick. He says, new contract for Todd Bates. Got to lock in someone with his coaching and recruiting ability going into the new conference. Yeah, it's had multiple reports. I think it was Matt Zenitz from 24-7 that put it out there first that they had extended Todd Bates, uh, bumped up his pay. I believe the number was like $900,000, making him one of the most most well compensated defensive line coaches in all of college football. And he's recruiting at a high level. Now he's got to develop those guys and develop some monsters to play in the interior of the sec. Well, and and that's another thing that coach Venable said, and he mentioned several guys on staff that, you know, there was the sharks were circling, trying to hire away his guys and, Coach Bates was one of those names that he mentioned, so it's not a shock to see that, um, you know, they've they've rewarded him for that. And frankly, the the recruiting that he's done warrants it. I mean, it's been a while since we've had what some uh, services call the number one defensive tackle in a recruiting class. So, you know, that's that gets you paid. It absolutely does. Congrats, Coach Bates. He's awesome, by the way. He's yeah, a, really a good fun guy. guy to be around. There are, there's some changes coming to college football, but we'll get to OU softball and OU basketball and all that stuff and winners and losers, but there are some changes coming to college football. So let's talk about them. But first loves travel stops is now offering a nationwide 10 cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel. Just download the loves connect app and scan your barcode at the prompt on screen and watch that price drop 10 cents per gallon. Across the country, the Loves Connect app unlocks exclusive deals can help any traveler plan their route or meal on the highway. So before you hit the road, be sure to download the Loves Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon and experience the country's best highway hospitality at Loves Travel Stops. Loves also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones with their expanded mobile to go zone. And of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious Java Hamore. And celebrate with a Schooner All-American Ale, the official craft beer of OU Athletics from Coop Ale Works. Named after the iconic Sooner Schooner that races across someone field after an OU score, you can join in on the celebration with an ice-cold beer from Coop Ale Works. You can enjoy it at the Palace on the Prairie, at OU Athletic Events, at the bar, the tailgate, and in the comfort of your own home. For more information on Schooner All-American Ale, visit schoonerale.com. Must be 21 to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Schooner All-American Ale. The taste of game day. And Simple Modern is an Oklahoma-owned company founded by former Sooners. Their mission statement is, we exist to give generously, and they've given millions away in product and donations to nonprofits all over the state and all over the country. 
Simple Modern is a great company with a great mission, and their products are also the perfect swag for any small business owner. You can customize tumblers, water bottles, and coffee mugs to give to current or potential customers. They will love the quality and how trendy they are. Check them out at simplemodern.com. College football roundup. Rules changes. There is, what's the best way to describe a college football sideline, Ted? A circus? A circus, yeah. That's right. A circus, there is a circus sure. on a college football sideline. You got different colored hats, guys signaling plays. You got different colored sweatshirts. You got the cardboard signs with all the goofy pictures on them. You got the vinyl signs attached to the PVC pipes to hide the signalers from the press box. You just, you got a lot going on. Got a lot going on. But a lot of that, hopefully, could be going away because the NCAA Football Rules Committee proposed a new rule that would allow one player on the field to have the speaker in his helmet, just like in the National Football League. Coaches will be able to communicate with that player up until 15 seconds to go on the play clock or when the ball is snapped. Ted, what do you think? I like it. I like it. It's, you know, NFL's had it for 25 years or so. And, you know, the technology has been there forever. And, you know, they tried to say what they Kirby Smart tried to say. This is not a knee-jerk reaction to the Michigan situation, but uh, why did we do any of the other 25 years leading up to this point, right? So I don't know. I, I think it's I think it's good. And, you know, one of the other things in there is, you know, oftentimes I, if a headset, if a group goes down, like you have to use the corded, like they make both sidelines use the same equipment. So there's not an advantage given like this is like an opt in or opt out thing. Uh, if one side's going to use it, the other side doesn't have to, or, you know, vice versa. So I like it. I think it makes sense. I think hopefully it gets rid of a lot of, you know, the, the miscommunication, just like the, the mess, it's a mess, right? Trying to get the, the calls and everything in. So I don't know. I think it'll streamline everything, but sometimes it just makes it harder, you know, because depending on who's got the microphone in their hand, <laughs> if you're the guy that's got the speakers in your ears, that can make life difficult on you. But I don't know. I think it's an overall positive for the sport. I was trying to think of why a team wouldn't do it because I truly think it, if you don't use, it, I think you're putting yourself at a competitive disadvantage because, and even if it's, it cuts off when the ball snapper cuts off with 15 seconds to go on the play clock, each one of these plays, and I can just speak from the offensive perspective. Each one of these plays, you can give like a tip or a reminder that can help whoever's got that. And it's going to be the quarterback on offense, obviously. Yeah. So whether hot, like it, it's yeah. a pass concept and, you know, hey, if you get the middle of the field open, remember this. It, it looks like and you can remind it. Hey, it looks like they're in this coverage. Like you can say all that stuff over the headset. I, I think it can be particularly helpful in situations where you have multiple plays called right? there's a lot of hey pass kill run run kill pass that type of stuff it's like hey this is the look that you run it so call the run i mean there's all kinds of ways to communicate things to the quarterback i just i was trying to think of why someone wouldn't use it and the only thing i could think of was if a team just wants to play with an incredible tempo, like go as fast as they can. And they just feel like signaling's more efficient, but even then wouldn't the coach want to have the ability to be able to mention a few things. So well, yeah, just because you have the speaker doesn't mean you can't still use your signal stuff. Right. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I bet, you know, the, the coordinators want to have a lot of control and, you know, they, I, 
I think now they just signal the whole thing to the entire offense, right? Everyone gets it at the same time and just kind of speeds the process up that way. But yeah, I I don't know. I I I hope that it changes the way a lot of offenses operate and the coach wants those things reported to the entire offense. And you could do that in this thing called a huddle. Get everyone together. Get a play call in. Maybe a tip or a reminder here and there. There you go. We'll see. I mean, here's the thing, though. To the casual observer on television and at the game, you won't notice a difference. I Unless you're looking for it. Uh, I'm just trying to think of how happy it would make me if they just made it a rule that you had to get in the huddle. <laughs> I know. I Signaling is now illegal. You must get into the huddle and get the play through the headset. Oh, it would make me so happy. But yeah, I guess in a in a perfect world, you're able to communicate that stuff. You still have some of your assistants signaling to whether it's route concepts to wide receivers or coverages to the defensive backs. But yeah, I'm I'm really interested in seeing what teams can become really, really efficient with this and what teams do it at the highest level? Because I do think that having that line of communication between a coach and a player on the field, I, I think it can be extremely valuable. I do too. I do too. I, I think it's good. I think um, I mean, it should go off without a hitch. And hopefully everyone is saying, why didn't we do this 20 years ago? I I'm with you. I'm hope that's what we're saying. I hope we're not saying, Oh my gosh, the speakers one, one guy's speaker caught on fire. <laughs> just like something catastrophic like that. It's like, I, that's what I'm saying. Like most people, you won't even notice, like, unless you're like looking for it, like in the first game, whenever it's like a new thing and people are talking about it, you'll notice it. But after that, it'll look like all the other football you've ever seen. Well, the only other, the only thing you're going to notice is quarterbacks on the road covering their ear holes. Yeah. That's yeah. what, wait, what's that quarterback? You don't see college quarterbacks do that. Well, they're going to start because the coach is going to be talking to them with their helmet. Yeah. Or it's like, please stop, stop. You're yelling, please stop. A couple other rule changes that appear to be coming. Two minute warning in the second quarter and in the fourth quarter. Gotta love another built-in commercial break, Ted. Come on, baby. What do you think? I we're used to it with the NFL. What one thing I do hope is if the networks now know they have this built-in commercial break, for the love of God, can we please reduce some of the okay, the team scored, we go to a TV timeout, the ball gets kicked off, we go to another TV timeout. If we can reduce that sequence. By adding a two-minute warning, I'm all for it, man, because that that drives me insane. Supposedly, that's what this rule is going to do because it gives you the built-in, we know when it's going to happen, TV timeout, right? It's built in. So you don't have to do the double-up thing everywhere, and, and I that's what's going to happen. But we know that, Eventually, they're going to add another. They're going to add more commercials somehow, somewhere. But here's the thing. It's just, yet again, it's another rule that makes it easier to score for the offense. You now have another built-in timeout in the most crucial moments of the game, before the half and at the end of the game. So not only do you get the clock to stop after every first down, Right in the final, you also get the two minute timeout. So, congratulations, offense. You win again. Should we talk about RPS? <laughs> Should I really get you get you going? Sure. No, I. Th there's no doubt. We'll we'll see how it ends up impacting. I think a lot of people will be keeping track. Okay, will this make the games on average five minutes, ten minutes longer, or anything like that, or do we see? the game times be pretty consistent to what we've seen from the last couple of years. 
we'll see. But the the only other thing that I saw from a rule change perspective is teams getting to have a bunch of tablets available to the players and the coaches uh, on the sideline and in the booth where they can watch game video. Now, we, I was shocked by this. When I've I've seen high schools do this, but in the NFL, unless something's changed, and I gosh, I've been out for a while now. Set formations. It was just pictures, still pictures. Yeah. Now I was on a tablet, but you didn't get video. You just got pictures, like right before the ball was snapped, like a couple seconds after it was snapped. Those were the pictures you got. Having the video is. I mean, that's going to change the entire mechanics of communication on the sideline. I I saw this, and they acted like it was no big deal, and it blew my that's mind. That's what like, I was thinking. Wait, it's like, I could watch this the is the whole... biggest thing. Forget the freaking everything else. Like, this is huge. I I just can't imagine how many iPads or surfaces or whatever they're going to be. So many of these things are going to get broken. <laughs> Mad coaches. You told me he slanted inside. He did it. Look at the tape. Breaks it on the pitch. It's it's gonna get all kinds of good uh good screenshots or little video clips of the sidelines, but I mean you think that it helps the product and you'll have a better product, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. It's another level of work for somebody. I don't know who's doing it, but somebody's like Somebody saw that role and was like, oh, my God. <laughs> Video coordinators across the country. Oh. No. I mean, no. that's quick. I mean, I I don't know how they cut it that fast. I mean, I, I don't know. It's That's impressive. It's almost like you have to have a live feed of some sort. I, once again, I, I don't know how any of that works. I really don't. Yeah, but. I don't either. That will, I mean, that can change things dramatically. I'm trying to think, do you think that's more of an offensive advantage or a defensive advantage? Or a wash? I don't, well, see, to me, I, like, I can, like, seeing it on film is fine, but, like, it's an added layer that I really don't need. I mean, if you could draw the play up, and what we were in, and I, and I can tell you where I was and what happened and where it should have been. Like, I really don't need the film, but some guys don't know what happened and don't know how to say what happened or what they saw. So, I mean, I can understand that, but I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I think that different guys need to see it different ways. I mean, I know that's, that's definitely something like the chalkboard or grease board just doesn't work for a lot of guys. So to be able to see it visually will probably help. I mean, I would say, I think defense to be able to react to like how they're blocking something a little bit differently quicker. Cause it's hard. Like if you're, if you're a defensive tackle and they're doubling you and like, there's a lot of stuff going on. Like maybe you're not exactly sure like how it's, I, I don't know. I think I would say defensively, but I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. I, it's hard to tell. I, I don't know, but yeah, these are, these things are going to significantly impact the game. So I am, especially, I think the iPad one or tablet or whatever they want to call it, being able to watch the film, that's maybe it'll just be too much where it's just system overload. And you see guys on the sideline going for, can we please stop watching this? I, I don't know I what I think it is. I, I mean, there, there is something to, I mean, a game is what? And I'm talking about for a football player, I know it's 60 minutes and I know like three and a half hours, but for a football player, like the preparation and the mental lock-in and focus has started hours before the game. And you are totally locked in the entire time. Like there needs to be a little bit of a lock-in and, and release with the, throughout a game like give me the things i need to work on and like what our mistakes were but i don't need to visually see all 15 snaps that just took place like i don't need that like i need 
some space in my mind to be able to actually go out there and play the football game, you know? Will this lead to players throughout college football losing their minds? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, but it's – I. I'm interested in what guys are going to think. I, I, I've i never done that. So uh, I'm interested to hear coaches and players talk about it once once they start using it on game day. So I know there's a lot of times I wanted to walk over the sideline and know what the hell just happened. Yes. Right? What was that? Yeah. So that will be nice for sure. Yeah, for sure. But in moderation, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. All right, let's finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend. But first. All you grill masters, listen up. Didier Ranch delivers premium quality beef that is 100% raised in Oklahoma right to your front door. Go to DidierRanch.com, D-I-D-I-E-R Ranch.com to order one of their premium quality beef boxes and use promo code OKLAHOMA15 for 15% off your order. Filet, ribeye, New York strip, sirloin, steak burgers, They've got it all, and they ship anywhere in the continental U.S., and Oklahomans can get deliveries in just one to two days. The only thing better than having a lot of premium beef on the O and D line is having premium beef delivered right to your front door. Due to your ranch, tradition tastes better. And head to the garage for hand-smashed patties, butter-toasted buns, and some ice-cold beer. It's the perfect spot to watch any big game. And with all the garage locations being open to 10 p.m. or later every night, it's the go-to late-night spot. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the weekend? Well, it was awesome to see Kelvin Sampson, Hollis Price, those guys back in the LNC. It wasn't great to see him wearing a different uniform, but it was cool to see those guys back. And we got one hell of a basketball game. We came up short, but it was a great effort by our guys. We were hitting threes. We were playing defense. We were running the floor. We were generating offense. Uh, what a game. Stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the number one team in the country and just came up a little bit short on a – Really, really nice last second quick shot by Houston to get the win. Really fun game. Wish we would have came out on top, but still, I I know we hate the moral victory thing, but we played top notch basketball on Saturday. I think despite the loss, it is I don't know. It it felt as well. It felt like that's as well as they've played in a while. Yep, I agree. And a bunch some, of guys, not just one or two, the whole group. And, and and sometimes, like Sam Godwin, for example. Great guy. Where has that guy been? And and sometimes you need the number one team in the country to come to your house to bring that out of some guys. And my hope is even though they lost the game, the way that they played, the physicality that they played with, the intensity that they played that game with, hopefully those guys are like, guys, we, we should do that more often. When we play that way, we're pretty damn good. Scoring yeah. 85 against Houston is impressive. Yes, it is. Really, yeah. really impressive. And once again, I'm, I'm not here celebrating the loss. That's not what I'm doing. But... My hope is the way that they played against, in my opinion, the best team they've played all season long. I I hope that they look at it in the way that they battle and go, guys, we're we're a pretty damn good basketball team if we play this way. Yeah. Hit a lot of open looks. Like that's been one of the things. Like you can you can hammer them on all kinds of stuff, but it comes back to making your quality looks and they made a lot of quality looks and that's the difference to me. I mean, you can, if you're just going to break it down to one thing for me, it's making a lot of those threes, finding ways to, to get guys open for some of those looks. And it was fun to watch. I was admittedly after, um, uh, what we score 45 against Iowa state or something like that. That it wasn't good. That game, watching that game made me sad. 
just as a basketball fan, especially as an OU basketball fan, that was that was a tough watch, and that's why the Houston game was so refreshing for me because I'm with you, man. I watched that Iowa State game and I walked away from it going, I don't, I'm sad. (laughs) Like it was a sad performance. I know we're better than that offensively, but we ain't going to find it against Houston. And that's where I was wrong. We did. And that's what makes, I mean, it was a, it was a great game start to finish. I mean, that was how many lead changes. I remember they were saying it during the broadcast lead changes in ties. It was just nonstop the entire game. Fun. Really fun. What a, what a game. What a night. I wish I would have been there. Yeah. I, I felt the same way. And if Shed doesn't hit that shot, who who knows, man? But that was some really nice play. And that's a really good Houston team. But I I think anyone I, I don't think you can watch that game and come away from it going, oh, you doesn't shouldn't shouldn't play in the tournament. Right. I, I and once again, you're you're not gonna get credit for that loss, but just the way that they played, uh, how good they looked offensively against arguably the best team in the country. I think there were probably a few people out there that were going, okay, is OU really a tournament team? There's this, there's this conversation that's taking place now. Is the Big 12 a little inflated and all those types of stuff? But I, I don't think you, you can watch what Porter Moser's group did on that floor in that game and go, yeah, that team doesn't belong in the tournament. I just... Yeah. Well, I know they win one more. This is what's crazy. And I know that the beginning of the season, I think, changed a lot of people's perspective on what we've witnessed here. If they beat Cincinnati or Texas, that's a 20 win season. You know, the last time they won 20 games? Final four year. 16? 2016 is the last time they won 20 games. Wow. Yeah. So that kind of brings it into perspective a little bit that this team has played better than like <laughs> bring up the schedule from last year. <laughs> okay. If, I mean, it's they've they're better than like our hope, like it's been changed because we were top 10 to start the season, right? And then it's made things like hard on us as fans to watch it. You feel like it's supposed to be this, this thing that, that, you know, maybe they were never should have been put in that position in the first place, but they are a good competitive team tournament team. And I think one more win, if they get to that 20 win mark should lock them into the tournament, but I guess you never know. I'm with you. I, I had a lot of fun watching that game. I know. I had so much That's more great. fun. Both were losses, but the feel like I had after the Houston game, if you compare it to the feeling I had after the Iowa State game, not even close, man. Getting, uh, getting, you know, scrapping, fighting for rebounds, you know, trying to knock the ball out on like that late exchange where they knocked that rebound out and hit that three. I mean, it was just, it was fun. It was more of that, please. That was great. Yes. Play like that more. That's it. That, that That's all we ask. All right. Who do you have as your loser of the weekend? All good things uh, must come to an end, I suppose. OU softball takes the first loss. So, 71 in a row. Yeah. I, I don't think it's a bad thing that that streak is over. Agree. Would I prefer it not happen against Louisiana? Probably, but I also don't know much about Louisiana softball program. All I know I'd is that happen pitcher, to Louisiana, the Texas or Oklahoma State. That's a great point. <laughs> but what what was her name? Ria Seto, the pitcher for them. My goodness, what a performance! Yeah, she she was nails. Um, didn't back down all the way through extras. Everything. And they had a hard time. I mean, typically when OU goes through the lineup the second time and then if the third time, if they're seeing the same pitcher, it's usually like 
you're about to see some fireworks. So I don't know exactly what she was doing, but they were having a hard time really zeroing in on it. Yeah. Did Patty Gasso handled it extremely well. I was watching her, her post-game press conference, but it is one of those things where if they're going to lose one, I like them losing early. Kind of refocus everything. But I also wanted them to start off with like a massive winning streak at Love's Field. But hey, yeah. you can't, sometimes it doesn't go that way. It is what it is. My God, does that stadium look awesome, though? Like the overhead yeah. shots. That was That was awesome. That was cool. And, you know, here's the thing, though, and I will let others that know more about it really speak to it, but, and it's really early. I'm just, I'm wondering if there's, and here we are, like, the streak is over and we're worried about the the flaws in the team. But, you know, they offensively, or I guess pitching-wise, they've been giving up quite a few runs. So, like, I don't know if there's, if there's like a legit thing to be concerned about there or not, I just, I don't know. Yeah. I will say that first game, the opener, Nicole May steps into the circle and it, what they scored three runs right off the bat. I was like, wait, what's going on here? <laughs> but yeah, I was like, I, I, I was worried they're going to lose the opener. I mean, was Kendi, Kenzie Hansen hit the, the walk off, right? Is that, was that the opener? I, they all run. They play so many games, man. They I all know. run together now. I think she. I think she hit a walk off in the opener to 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 you know snatch the win there. You're but. right. That was that. Yeah, that was the. But hey, nothing wrong with a little excitement in our lives. Blowing everyone out is boring. People, come on. I totally agree. And um, Aaron Miller was on the uh, the broadcast on ESPN Plus, and she's like. I think there's going to be a rough week of practice <laughs> for these girls because they just weren't clean. I mean, they weren't as clean as we're used to seeing them. So uh, that can uh, that can go a long way. Learn getting from used it. to the new field, you know, getting used to the the new surroundings. It'll be fine. I'm not worried about it. Not worried about it. But no. yeah, it was. I I did not see that one coming. Thought they were going to steamroll them, but hey, yep. they'll end up being better for it, Ted. That's the hope. Let's finish up with my winner and loser. But first, attention business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from your insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. And head to OpolisClothing.com for our podcast merchandise and the best OU gear out there. That's O-P-O-L-I-S Clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off. That's OpolisClothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. All right, for my winner of the weekend, thought about going with the Boston Celtics. Did you see that? I saw it was on. I did not watch it, though. Beat they, down, huh? they beat the Golden State Warriors by 52 points. Woo. 140 to 88. Uh, I mean, game just went completely off the rails. And I was excited for that one because Boston had won, I think, 10 in a row coming into it. Golden State had won 11 out of 13 coming into it. Golden State found their mojo a little bit. I'm sitting there, okay. Steph Curry, even though a little knee soreness or something, but you know, let's see how this looks. In the second quarter, it was just, I mean, it was a bloodbath. Boston's really good, dude. Yeah. I mean, this just did. The team with I by guess. far the best record in the NBA is really good. But 48 and 12, and man, they are looking like. I know it's hard to write Denver off because of Jokic and, and what they did a season ago, the the, the Clippers with, with what they've got going on. 
Now, some people want to throw the thunder in that conversation. I definitely want to throw them in there, but the youth, that's always going to be brought up. But Boston is just, they look strong. Yeah. And, you know, I think there's also something, like some of these teams, I think Golden State would probably qualify. Um, like Denver definitely qualifies. Like some of these teams that have had some recent really good success, I mean, part of it is like, listen, you want to fight that fight, go ahead. We're We're saving up for the playoffs to a certain degree, right? You know, whenever you start to get later in the season, and you have a bad second quarter, you know, sometimes it's like, all right, boys, all right, we know what's going on here. So, you know, I, it all will equal out to some degree when you get into the postseason. But, you know, the other point is, is like, sometimes you just don't have the ability to hit the gas like you used to. You should have to do something for your fans if you get beat by 50. You know how there's the things at the games now where everyone gets like a free taco or a free slice of pizza, or the, these kind of promotional things. If your fans have to sit there and watch you get beat by 50, they deserve a free taco or something. <laughs> Just, and I know it was on the road, but so, three refills on the way out of the stadium. Yeah, or something. something, man. If you were a Warriors fan in Boston having to watch that, you deserve to walk out of there with something for free because it was just, I mean, absolutely brutal. Oh, that's funny. My, I'm going to, my winner of the weekend though, I'm going savior worthy. And I know, oh, you fans, we got our jokes off, right? He, yes, he couldn't score a touchdown. Right? Epic, epic goal line stand. Couldn't get in for the touchdown. His production was solid. At Texas, but that dude was flying. I make all the jokes you want. That dude was flying. Four two one. New combine record. That was it was cool to watch. The the celebration afterwards. And I I respect the fact that he went, what'd he go on his first one? Four two five. He could have easily said, I'm done. Four two five is on the board. That's all I need. That is blazing fast. But to his credit, he said, I want to go get that record. And he went and got it. That's crazy. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. And insane speed. I know. And I don't want to sound like a hater, but does he play that fast? Like some guys, you look at them and you're shocked that they aren't faster than what they are. Like, and I'm in no means am I, am I saying that he's slow, but the I never would have guessed that, like, if you would have just asked me, and I don't know, I never would have guessed that that, is, that guy's capable of the combine record. You, If you would have asked me, hey, what do you think he's going to run? I would have said 4 three, seven. Right. Yeah, that's kind of, that's that's basically what I'm saying. I, I've never seen a play from him where I was just like, oh, my God. Well, like, he, that guy's clearly the fastest guy on. A couple, the- couple years ago when he took the first pass of the game, 75 yards right down the sideline, he looked pretty yeah, fast. He did. Did you see Deshaun White's tweet? <laughs> he said, he said, and, and you guys uh, were all saying I'm slow, and this man's <laughs> out here running 4-2. <laughs> Pretty good. Well done, Deshaun. Way to go. No, I, good. it was, I, you watch the combine for moments like that. Yeah. Right. For these just freaky displays of athleticism. And that was cool. It was fun to watch, man. Congrats cool. to Xavier Worthy. Yep. That will, um, that will not hurt him in the draft process. That's for sure. I think he may have made a few dollars. There's that no 40 doubt. Time. Yep. For my loser of the weekend. Thought about going with the New York Knicks. Not good. Non-contact injury to your best player. Not good. We'll, we'll see what ends up happening with Jalen Brunson, but weak the knee. 
really killed the buzz of that game. He's been so good, man. And it seems like he's Mr. New York City now. Uh, that sucks. Did not look good. Yeah. I'll tell you that, like, I don't know how good the Knicks are now. I haven't seen them. But I think the Knicks may be, in the time I've been watching sports, 25-ish years, maybe a little bit more, they may be the worst team during that entire tenure of any professional sports team that I can think of. 25 plus years. No threat ever of any time that I can remember to do anything of consequence throughout. Sometimes maybe they've been okay and made the playoffs, but like the the biggest thing I can remember happening from the Knicks was Lynn Sanity. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it, uh, haven't they? Uh, hasn't everyone in the NBA kind of had their turn at one time or another, for the most part, except for them? They lost in the Eastern Conference Finals in 1999. And That's I, about the time I'm talking about. Whenever I started watching basketball, yeah, or and watching I, sports, and I don't believe they've been back to the conference finals since. So yeah, yeah, it 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 hasn't gone particularly well. And it's New York City. Like oh, you're going to play for the Knicks like that's said like that's supposed to be like some good thing. That's a horrible thing. It's terrible. I don't know. Just just was thinking about it. They were they were having a solid year. I think as of today, they were the four seed in the East, but if Brunson's hurt, they're toast. So we'll, we'll see, but their, their most famous period is when they would lose to Jordan in the Eastern conference in the playoffs with Ewing. That happened to a lot of people though, to their defense. I know. I'm just saying like, that's, that was like their heyday, you know? <laughs> the good old I days. Did, I did not know you were a Knicks hater. Look at you. Well, I'm not. I'm just, it's, I think it's interesting. It is. Uh, but my loser of the weekend, the 12 team college football playoff. Because <laughs> I think we're only getting it for two years, Ted. What do you think? 14 teamer. Some of these details, and, and these are just reports, nothing's finalized, but. Multiple reports that the SEC and Big Ten would get three automatic qualifiers from each of their conferences. Uh, there's also, I guess, discussions that the SEC champ and the Big Ten champ would be the two teams that get buys in a 14-team college football playoff. Big 12 and ACC would get two automatic spots each. This is a lot, man. We we haven't even seen how the 12-team playoff is going to work with the 5-plus-7 model. And now it seems like the SEC and the Big Ten, they want theirs, man. They're throwing their weight around. Um, I think three automatic qualifiers is I like when you just hit me with it and I've just you know, I've seen it previously and talked about it, but I think it's stupid. Um, I mean, I understand that they wanted they're gonna they have the ability to negotiate that and they're gonna try. Like I, I get that, but I, I don't know. It just three automatic qualifiers. It seems like a bit much for me, but here's, here's my main problem. If it's going to be 14, it should be 16 and there should not, no one should get a buy. My problem with the buy in college football in the NFL, it's totally different because they play so many games and the schedules are nearly identical i mean there's a little bit of difference between them but the teams are so close the schedules are really close but in in college football there's such a big like even in the conference like if you look at our schedule next year and they look at like missouri's 
It ain't even close. So in my opinion, there's, I don't think you should be able to earn a buy because of how large the discrepancy in schedules is from one team to the next. That's basically the point. So if you're doing 14, you might as well just do 16 and, and eliminate the conference championship game. Yeah, and maybe that's what they end up doing. But if this is the system, the buy should go to the two highest ranked teams. I don't care what conference they're from. Yeah. And, and maybe this maybe this is just the Big Ten and the SEC making some big asks to where they land, where they're just getting like a bigger piece of the CFP revenue or something. And they're throwing well, some stuff yeah. out there like that to get more of the like a larger piece of the pie. But I, I don't know. But I, I don't think it makes any sense to predetermine what conference champions are getting a buy. Right. I, I, I don't think that makes any sense at all. Well, I I think the reason it makes sense on their end is if you have a 14 team playoff, how much does the conference championship mean to us? I, I get, yeah, we'd be sec champ, but we're playing an extra game that in the grand scheme of things towards winning the title doesn't matter unless you attach something to it where the winner gets a buy. You know what I'm saying? Because nah. no, yeah, that may, I I understand what you're saying. If you're playing 14 team playoff, it's like why? Like we got some guys banged up, coach. Like what? What? You know, we don't have to win it. We're in. We're automatic qualifier. There's no reason for us to to you know to sell out to win this football game. You know, let's rest some of our star guys. Get some injured guys back. We'll take the loss, but the worst thing is we host a home playoff game instead of getting a bye. You know, so I, I don't know. That's that's kind of the things that they have to kind of work through a little bit, I think. I've I've heard some people over the last couple of years suggest that the conference championship game in this format where you get three automatic qualifiers, where it should be your number three team versus your number four team and the winner gets a spot. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I that would create some drama because the, the, then it's really, then, then I get, it's like a play in game. Exactly. Yeah. I like that. That would, that would be fun. Now I don't know how all of that would work for the top two teams in the conference. You would, you would assume that they're going to be in the playoff and the, just the highest ranked one's going to be the higher seed. But if 14 is the number, I think it should be the four conference champs and then 10 at largest. That's what I want. Uh, that way, the regular season, like in winning a conference title feels good. If you're going to connect it to that and still play conference championship games, and then the top two teams in the country should get the bye. Yeah. That seems the easiest way to do it. If you're, if 14 is the number, four conference champs, 10 at largest, number one and number two get the bye. If that's the number. Yeah. That's how they should yeah. do it, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's a there's a lot of fun scenarios to think about and cool ways you could do it. But remember, none of that matters. They don't care what you think. It's all about what will make the most money. Which is fine, I guess. I mean, it's just yeah. the nature of that's how it goes. I we're gonna watch and talk about it. That's what I know. No matter how many they could throw us a thirty two team playoff. Hey, I I am thrilled with the 12 team playoff. I will be even more thrilled. Like the better thing about the 14 is you only have two by teams and you get a bigger round of home playoff games. And I don't, I, and maybe, maybe I'm uh, not as much in the majority as I think, but to me, the coolest thing about the playoff is the home playoff games like that. That is like the coolest thing about these playoffs to me. And if you get more of that, sign me up. I'm with you. Birthday shout outs. Happy 11th birthday to Jeremiah Boswick. Happy 16th birthday to Noah. Good night. And happy 44th birthday to Kurt Lehman. Um, look, it must be a hell of a guy there. 
What a last name. Weird spelling. What a weird last name. <laughs> On that note, episode 401 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop on Wednesday. Just a reminder, please subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hope you all have a great start to your week. And until next time, we appreciate you all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.